Today we'll be talking about finding the maximum flow in a network. To start discussing this, there are some key concepts to run through. This is a directed weighted graph, which in this case can be interpreted and from here on referred to as a flow network. Flow network consists of vertices, in this example, V1 and V2, as well as a single vertex known as the source and a single vertex known as the sink. Each edge represents the direction of flow. Each number on the edge represents the maximum capacity that can be pushed along that edge from one vertex to another. We have a problem. How do we find the maximum flow within the network from the source to the sink? Let's run through an example. This is our initial flow diagram. Currently there is nothing flowing through the network, therefore we can choose any augmented path at random. This is the residual network of the flow diagram. It shows the flow that could be pushed in either direction at each vertex. In the path we have to find the edge with the minimum capacity, also known as critical edge. In our case it is the edge with capacity 2. Therefore pushing 2 along the path will give us 0 from source to V1 with 2 being pushed back and 2 from V1 to sink with 2 being pushed back as the edge has capacity of 4. As for the rest we have not pushed any value therefore the original amount can still be pushed with zero being pushed back the other way. Let's update our flow network. We now have a flow of two going across the top path, reaching maximum capacity along the edge from the source to V1. As for the other edges, once again we have not pushed anything along them. Now we repeat the same steps with another augmenting path. Let's choose this one. The critical edge of this can be seen as five, therefore that's the amount we can push along the path. Now for the residual network. The top edges remain as they were previously, so they're not in our augmenting path. From the sink to V2, we now put 5, from 0 return in the alternative way. This edge has capacity 6, therefore we push 5 from V2 to source, with 1 going back. For the last edges, nothing has been pushed along them, so they remain unchanged. Time to update our flow network. 2 has been pushed back from V1 to source and from sink to V1, therefore 2 out of 2 and 2 out of 4. 5 has been pushed back from sink to V2, therefore maximum capacity has been reached on this edge. From V2 to source, 5 has been pushed, therefore 5 out of 6. As for the other edge, it is still unchanged. What path do we choose next? We have reached maximum capacity on this edge as well as this edge, meaning there is now no more available path from the source to the sink. We cannot augment this network further. Therefore, we can now work out the maximum flow within the network. To do this, we look at the residual network. The maximum flow is the sum of the flow entering the source or leaving the sink. Therefore, 2 and 5. 2 and 5 is 7, which is our max flow. This is the example that we are going to work through. You can see the immediate problem with this network is the fact that we have two sources, S1 and S2. To get around this problem, we need to convert this into this. What we've done here is we have made the old sources, normal vertices, V4 and V5, added our new single source, S, and we have done edges from S to V4 and V5 with capacities that are bigger than or at least equal to any other capacity in the network. We've chosen 200. Next we need to get rid of this edge. This is a non-antiparallel edge and to get rid of it we need to change this graph into this. What we've done here is we've added another vertex, V6, and the graph is still the same. We've just added an edge with the capacity 5 from V2 to V1 and two edges, capacity 15 from V1 to V6 to V2. The algorithm that we're going to use for solving the max flow is this one. First, we need to choose the route from the source to the sink, which has the least number of edges, making sure we can push something down this path. We choose the path that has the least number of edges because this way we will eliminate a critical edge from the network on every step we take. This improves the time complexity relative to the method that we used before when we picked a random path from the source to the sink. The second step we'll take is to highlight the path on the flow diagram. The third step, identify the critical edge in this path and we need to push 
that amount of flow through the network. We'll then draw the new residual network and then convert that residual network back to an augmented flow diagram. We'll repeat these steps until there's, until there's no other route from S to T. So step one. First, I'm just going to write on the current flow that we're pushing through this network. Since it's the first step, all I'm going to put is zeros. Now I'm going to choose the shortest path from S to T. You can see it's this path. S, V5, V3, T. There's only three edges on this path. We can see the critical edge is the one that has capacity 20. We'll push 20. That means the residual network will look like this. The residual network shows what could be pushed down the edge. We could now push 20 back all of these edges. All the rest of the edges will still be the same. We now need to convert this back to a flow diagram. To do this, all we need to do is label the edges with the amount of flow we're pushing down them. So you can see from S to V5, we're pushing 20 out of 200. From V5 to V3, we're pushing 20 out of 26. And from V3 to T, we're pushing 20 out of 20. All other edges will be labelled zero out of the capacity. OK, now moving on to step two. Already drawn is the network that we have just created in step number one edges which we push 20 down are now shown to have 20 flowing down these edges. We now need to choose the next shortest path which is this one. S, V4, V1, V6, V2, T. There are other paths that are as short as this one and we can choose randomly between these paths. Now we're going to draw the residual network. You can see the critical edge down this path is the one that has capacity 15. There are two edges with this capacity, doesn't matter which one we choose as the critical edge. So now we're going to draw the residual network, it shows that we've pushed 15 down the path we have chosen. The residual network shows what could be pushed down each edge. You can see here, for example, edge V6 to V2, we now could push nothing more forwards, but we could still push 15 back down that edge. As another example, the edge from S to V4, we could push 15 back and we could still push 185 forwards. All other edges on the residual network will stay the same as they were before, seeing as we've not pushed anything more down there. In the top left corner, you can see what we've got is the new augmented flow diagram, which has been obtained from the residual network we have just created. From this, we need to choose the next shortest path from S to T. You can see we now can't take either of these two edges because we're already pushing the maximum flow. We can't take this edge from V3 to T because we're already pushing the maximum flow, which means there's actually no path from S to T. When there's no path from S to T, the algorithm is actually completed. We now need to look back at the residual network to find the value of the maximum flow. To find the maximum flow, we need to see what is either coming out of the sink or into the source. Out of the sink, we have 15 and 20. This means our maximum flow is 35. Now I'm going to try and demonstrate why choosing the shortest path from S to T makes the algorithm faster. For example, if we go back to step one, imagine we initially chose this route from S to T. You can see the critical edge there is V2, V3, which is a capacity of three. Now if we draw the residual network quickly, and then try and choose another path from S to T, for example, this one, because we can now push three back up this edge. Again, the critical edge is the same one with the capacity of 3. Now the residual network will look like this. Now you can see, we could keep doing these two paths over and over again. Because in the example we worked through, we chose the shortest path, we never had a problem of the bottleneck V2, V3. This is due to the fact that we eliminated an edge on every step of the algorithm. What is the time complexity? The time complexity depends on the order which we choose our augmenting path. If we did not use the Edmonds Karp algorithm, the runtime would be this. Using the algorithm, the time complexity is improved due to at least one critical edge disappearing in the residual network at each step. If it disappears, it cannot reappear. Therefore, the total number of critical edges and thus the number of iterations is big O of VE. Each iteration runs big O of E times. Therefore, the total running time is big O, VE squared. Thank you for watching.